Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us uh, this evening for the Photosonic Landscape Panel. I hope that uh, wherever you are, that you are healthy and safe and well cared for. My name is Erich Berger. I speak to you from Helsinki in Finland, and I'm the director of the BioArt Society, which organizes this event tonight as part of the two years biofriction project, which is the collaboration between hunger.org in Barcelona, Jasnikova in Ljubljana, Cultivamos Cultura in Lisbon, and us, the BioArt Society. It is funded by Creative Europe program of the European Union. Before I go into more details about the evening, I would like to put your attention to a few other matters. Uh, first, our new book, Art as We Don't Know It, which we published at Alto uh, Arts Books in collaboration with Euphilia, the base for biological arts at the Alto University. And uh, you can either download a free PDF copy from the website or order it uh, from there. And the book is edited by Kira O'Reilly, Kasari Mekirenika, Helena Sederholm, and myself, and presents you with art and research that has grown and flourished within our wider network over the years. And rather than stage a retrospective, we decided to invite writings that look forward and invite speculations about potential directions of our diverse practices, and hence the name. And I also would like to encourage you to visit uh, another exhibition than the one we are talking about tonight, uh, the exhibition Chris Crossing Ecologies, which is currently on show at Anantalo in Helsinki. And please also visit our website to sign up for our newsletter to learn more about the program, our activities and the opportunities we offer. But now I want to switch over to tonight and um, as you maybe have read before, our panel is conceived in relation to our current exhibition at Solo Space, <clears throat> which is called Photosonic Landscape in Color, with artists Nina Longström and Lea Biewermann. And both works stem from a mutual interest and exploration of photo or film as scientific material and how they relate to cultural ideas surrounding the concept of image. The film uh, from Minna invites us to join the pioneering scientist Sarah Martin, who is also with us tonight, uh, to join her in to her investigations of the sun. And it is a portrait of a producer of scientific images, as you wish, but also a mediation on the materiality of the research. Leah's work, on the other hand, leads us with a film to Kilpisjavi uh, at our residency place in the surroundings and with her voice extrapolating from the landscape there, weaving observations and scientific knowledge to a poetic web which spans over space and time. And while the films have no problem standing on their own, they really complement each other in an exceptional way, and we will hear more about it tonight. Tuti Rantanen, the program coordinator of Abe Aronia based solar astronomer Sarah Martin. And Tuti will tell you more about them, except for Sarah, will, which I will introduce to you now because she will generally introduce us to her bio, pioneering research before the panel. So welcome, Sarah, and thank you for joining us tonight, which is actually your early morning. And um, a few words about you. Uh, Sarah is a solar astronomer based in California, as I said, in the US. She is the executive director of Helio Research, a nonprofit corporation for research and education in the astronomical sciences. And Sarah's research in solar astronomy includes studies of solar activity, including active regions, sunspots, filaments, prominences, small scale ephemeral activity, and worked with and guided the research projects of many postdoctorates, graduates, and undergraduates. And she has worked with solar telescopes and most recently the Martin Telescope at Helio Research. And I will hand over the word now to Sarah, uh, but wish all of you a splendid evening and thank you again for joining us. Sarah, please. If okay. You... 
Vaishnav. I'm so pleased to be a part of this uh, um, artistic program and um, and able to share uh, my scientific work with you. So, um, at what point are um, we to begin the slides? Um, So um, should I, um, I think I should ask now for the first slide of the presentation, um, which is the title. So I began. Yes, we are showing it. Are you showing it? Ah, thank you. Okay. Um, so in the, um, uh, okay, <laughs> sorry, sorry for the rough beginning here. Um, my path of acquaintance with um, solar astronomy included the topic of um, what I call filament prominences. And um, these are strange, beautiful, mysterious structures on the sun. And um, I began my career and first learned about these at the McMath Hulbert Observat Observatory. Uh, I was a student at that time at Michigan Tech and was uh, one of five students that worked at the observatory um, uh, during the first summer. I had a job there at the McMath Observatory. And the um, this is my introduction to the sun, and I will share the, with you then my, my introduction. So uh, here we have um, a slide showing the sun and all the different features, and just the ones that I'll be talking about. So active regions um, are important to here. Solar flares are brightenings in active regions, and over here on uh, the upper right is an example of a solar flare. And um, the other primary feature are filaments, which are the dark linear structures that are seen in various places over this image. And um, sunspots, I will not mention much because they're embedded in, in the plage and I simply use the term active region. So the, uh, then at the limb of the sun, uh, here's an example of flare loops. So a solar flare that's bright on the disk will appear as looped limb. They will be bright normally, um, and and they will um, they will um, appear dark on the disk. So the bright thing initially on the disk is now going across the disk, and this should repeat once more. And this shows you that solar rotation uh, is 15 about 13 degrees per day. So um, if we start this one again, I don't know if you can do that. Um, uh, we will be able to see then that all the bright prominences, some of the bright prominences become what we call filaments on the disk. And we have two different names for them because yeah, as we see in Sarah, the next slide. Can you tell Matteo, please, which slide are you on at the moment? You need to tell him when to change the slide. Okay, go, go to the next slide now. Thank you. Slide number what? Um, three. Thank you. Can I just say next slide? Yes, you can just say next slide, but we need to know from which slide we are working off. Um, we want uh, slide three next. Okay, so th this is a repeat, but watch these structures go across the disc. So here's the filament that was a prominence on the limb. So not, not all filaments on the disk have a limb counterpart. And so we have two different names for them because there are prominences that don't show as filaments. And so sometimes I'll call them filaments or filament prominences uh, to let you know that it's the same structures can be seen in both locations. 
let's go to the next slide. So is there a problem in going to the next slide? No, just continue, it's fine. Oh, can Matteo hear me? Um, Matteo oh. can hear you, yeah. Okay, so here's an enlarged view of the same uh, idea that prominences are bright on the limb and, and then they show as absorption or dark features against the solar disk providing they're sufficiently dense. Okay, so after learning about the sun, I was eager to have a job in solar astronomy. And luckily, uh, I was able to, to get a job at the Lockheed Solar Observatory. And I was just showing the, this is number, I don't have these numbered uh, carefully, um, but this, this is the slide of the telescopes and, um, uh, so we saw both the full disk and enlarged images um, with the, um, the larger telescope. The images weren't all taken by these telescopes. This is just to show uh, what solar telescopes um, typically um, can look like. Every telescope is different, so there's no, um, no way to... Um, there, there's no uh, typical, really typical one. Okay, but uh, with one of this uh, smaller telescope, one can see very nice images of the full sun. And there was an active region, I'm sorry, I did that. Um, the active region with a sunspot and, a, and then an intermediate filament with a quiescent section. Up, up here where it's broken up, appears to be broken up, then another intermediate solid section and then what we call an active region filament. Now going to the next slide, I hope you're keeping. Um, here's the names of the ones we're looking at. We're not going to talk about these, so I'm gonna quickly go to the next slide and show you that sometimes filaments can be very, very long. Um, so, so uh, this one is almost the full diameter of the sun. And the Earth in, on this scale is about the size of this sunspot. So going to the next side, we see a high resolution image uh, taken at the Lockheed Solar Observatory, um, which is in Southern California. And um, so we are able then to have some of the finest images um, in the world and, and um, What I want to show is that solar flares occur where the plage where there's already bright plage. So a typical place for a solar flare would be at this location. And you can see there's a narrow dark area in between. So this dark channel here is where a filament would form. And flares always occur in a very special relationship to filaments. Um, and typically the filaments erupt before the solar flare occurs. So that was the first thing about filaments that intrigued me the most is, is it possible, is it possible to, to predict the eruption of filament? So I'll pick up that topic later. Um, but flare, flares also, as I mentioned in the previous images, appear as flare loops. And um, if seen above the limb, we see the loops. Against the disc, we rarely see the loops unless the flare is exceedingly bright. Um, I can't see the movie, <laughs> uh, but it starts out with a filament against the disc and it is um, beginning to erupt, but it's erupting in the line of sight. And so initially it looks like nothing is happening, but then suddenly it, as it erupts over the limb, then you will see um, the mass motions in the filament. And those motions coming towards us are blue and those going away from us are red. It goes then suddenly, it 
as it erupts over the limb, then you will see um, the mass motions in the filament. And those motions coming towards us are blue, and those going away from us are red. It goes through several loops. So after a couple, two or three loops, you can stop the movie and then go on to the next slide. The next slide is uh, an image in hydrogen alpha, as we've been looking at, because we only see the filaments prominence as well in the hydrogen line. It can be seen in other lines of the solar spectrum, but not as well. And um, this is slide is paired with the next slide, which is a magnetogram. And this shows us if we compare, we, if we back and forth between these, the previous slide, this slide, we can see that the filaments form at boundaries between the opposite polarity magnetic fields. So this is uh, a very important topic then, the solar magnetic fields um, is um, something that we began studying at the Lockheed Solar Observatory. And um, uh, after 15 years of working there, the observatory moved to Palo Alto, California. I continued to work with Lockheed for a year remotely and then took a job at the San Fernando Observatory, which is in the next slide. Um, the San Fernando Observatory um, was built by the Aerospace Corporation and uh, it, it was transferred to California State Northridge um, uh, for its future after an earthquake um, caused the large telescope to be shifted off of its pedestals and um, in the picture here, it has been repaired on the exterior, but the interior telescopes weren't made. So, so I was able to use the uh, small telescopes in the small dome and hope called the steam whistle on the right. And using these um, and having written a successful proposal, I was able to uh, hire students to do a project and our the project that I chose, um, I can illustrate with the next series of images, which are a succession of daily images. And uh, the project begins with the knowledge from a paper by Anton Brucek in 1952, in which he found that there was a relationship between the birth of active regions and, and the um, the um, disappearance or eruption of a filament. So the filaments erupt against it, it disappears. But, but we know that, that this is how almost all filaments disappear is by eruption. So because he found this relationship that within um, four days of the birth of a new active region, any filament in its environment was very, very likely to erupt. And so we decided to follow up on this very interesting possibility of being able to predict the eruption of filaments in those cases in which they occurred near an active region. And so we studied a succession of images as which you can see are the next five slides. And if um, it's poss possible to backtrack between these um, images, um, you will see that initially there's a filament, it's gone in the second slide, a quiescent filament that is about as far as the other, it is that active, that bright new active region is from the next one. As we go through this series, we can see that the filament changes from day to day and then it disappears. Um, so this is an example of the finding of Bruchek. And so we studied many of these examples and we actually did our own predictions, sort of an in-house project. And, 
And every time we saw a new active region with a filament in its vicinity, we made a prediction that this was one of the cases in the Bruchek study, and we should um, take images of it and, and make a prediction that it would erupt within the next four days. And what we found from this study is um, listed in the next slide after, these, after this series of images. And it, the um, first thing, of course, is we confirmed the relationship found by Bruchek. And we added the new information that in this situation where filaments erupt in the proximity of new active regions, they're related to the rate of growth of the active region, that's a new active region. They're inversely related to the magnetic flux in the photosphere around the filaments. And in other words, the weaker the filament, the more likely it is to erupt. And then it's also active region, the more likely it is to erupt. So with these three relationships, then I knew in going forward that there were some circumstances in which we could indeed erupt of, um, anticipate the eruption of filaments and actually observe, observe them uh, if they happen to occur in our roughly eight to 10 hour window uh, in the solar day. So um, after five years at the San Fernando Observatory, um, I had an opportunity to change jobs and go to the Big Bear Solar Observatory. Um, this was operated, uh, it was built uh, under the direction of Dr. Harold Zirin and was being built at the same time that I was working at Lockheed. So I was very familiar uh, with what was going on at Big Bear as all the observatories in Southern California, the, everybody knew each other. So the picture of the slide with the observatory with the lake around it and the causeway between is the first one in this, um, in this set. Um, so I was um, um, e eager to do another um, study at the Big Bear Solar Observatory on magnetic fields. As you can see from what I've said so far, that the magnetic fields are really very, very important to understanding filaments, solar flares, and eruption of solar flares. Um, however, when I got to Big Bear Observatory, I found that they could observe the quiet sun magnetic fields. And that was very exciting to me because I had worked with um, Karen Harvey writing three papers on quiet sun magnetic fields of the smallest active regions that occur. And so I was really anxious to be able to study in time-lapse photography, the relationship of the new active regions to, uh, to their magnetic fields. And so the next um, slide um, shows the uh, telescopes inside the dome. The upper end is on the left. The lower end with all the cameras is on the right. And so what you're looking at is the, the cameras and the filters um, for four different optical systems, all on the same mount, all operating at the same time. So this was um, quite a feat um, in their building this. And this was uh, uh, definitely an advancement in our tech technology. And sun. Uh, the next slide is the picture of the magnetic fields on on this on the quiet sun. And um, the movie, um, which I'm going to play in front of me. Um, uh, the movie shows actually a decaying active region. And you can see as the magnetic fields uh, move around that opposite polarities tend to collide along in the middle. And wherever a new little opposite polarity appears, say the white inside the black area, um, the fields disappear. So white is positive polarity, black is negative polarity. And what I'm fascinated with is the disappearance of magnetic flux because I had never seen this before, and I, very few people had ever seen magnetic flux disappearing. So we always would 
you know, does it come go back to where it comes from, or is there some other process happening? Um, in the um, other movie, the Quiet Sun movie, um, let's see, which I'm not, not seeing. Excuse me for a minute. Um, the Quiet the Quiet Sun movie shows um, uh, and it a small area in which the flux is disappearing and is more clear than in the, the other And so that a lot of energy must be leaving those regions where the flux is canceling. And indeed, I thought that this was due, that, that this is a possible source of the solar wind. So I went ahead and uh, published a paper on this speculation that canceling magnetic fields are on the quiet sun are the places where the solar wind actually comes from. And follow, following the two movies is a next slide. And in this slide, it is um, a schematic of the disappearance of the magnetic flux. And so if we have two elements as between the area, as between the two arrows, um, they're moving towards each other and they simply disappear in our, in our magnetogram. Um, but we know that they're not submerging because these two elements are not originating together. They're not coming to the surface as one unit, rather they're, they're flux that has previously um, come to the surface or developed at the surface and are, is connected to somewhere else on the sun. But since we're only use, looking at the line of sight component, we cannot see where each of these little black and white elements is connected to another magnetic field. Um, and But the fact of that connection means that they cannot be submerging, and therefore the disappearance must be due to the outward movement of the magnetic field, um, a process we called um, magnetic reconnection initiates this process. And as the reconnection occurs, then it's possible for mass to be lifted into the corona and either ejected along the existing magnetic fields in the corona at a local site, or if it's on the quiet sun, the ejection can then move <coughs> particles out into the solar wind. The, um, the next slide is also a schematic, and it, it uh, is our conception of how the magnetic reconnection occurs in conjunction with the canceling magnetic fields. So the uh, two little opposite polarity elements in the middle move together as they do. The field lines gradually connect, rise into the corona, and form longer field lines. So this process happening all along the opposite polarity boundaries within any two magnetic fields of opposite polarity then um, creates more and more magnetic field in the solar corona. Well, eventually, if all if the canceling fields are always putting material into the corona, eventually something has got to give, and that's what. And that's why the sun has um, eruptive solar events. But how do we know about this process? Well, it's taken many years to study this, to understand it. Um, and I'll talk again about that at the end. Um, in the meantime, um, every place I've worked, I go back to the subject of filaments. And I bring up then the next slide is showing the structure of a filament in um, an active region. The filament is between areas of plage of opposite polarity. To the right is the sunspot. Sun, this sunspot is about the size of the Earth. The inner dark part, the umbra, the outer dark part is the penumbra. And um, so active regions, sunspots always exist in these active regions. But filaments are never near sunspots. They're always distant from the sunspot where there's boundaries between opposite polarity. Um, 
In rare occasions, however, the sunspot can be two polarities and actually a filament can cross a sunspot. But uh, with such strong fields, these are, this is not a common phenomenon. The, um, the interesting thing here now is that we see a fine, finer structure than we've seen in, in most of the previous images. So with very high quality images under very good seeing conditions, we can um, see structure in the filaments. And the filaments are cons consist of a spine, which is the long axis of the filament. And then on either side, or both sides, typically both sides, but we only see one side often, there will be little threads of the filament that connect to the chromosphere. Um, these are not separate. We use a separate name, barbs, but they're not separate. They're all a part of typical filaments. Filaments in active regions don't have very many barbs. We only see a few in this image. Um, however, in the next image, we see um, uh, two examples of filaments. The one on the left, um, uh, and the comparison, the, I should say the comparison of the one on the left with the comparison with the one on the right, um, shows that these filaments actually have um, different structures in, in the barbs relative to the spine of the filament. So the spine is along here. And the barbs are the uh, projections away from it. And in the high resolution observations, um, one day I direction um, on, on each side of the filament. And we can see that in the lower resolution filament, even though it's not quite as clear, if it's a large filament, we can see on the right that from the relative to the top of the spine, the structures, the fine structures, go down to the chrom chromosphere to the right relative to the spine. So imagine yourself to the side of the filament, looking at it broadside. The structure is going to the right. In the one on the left, the fine structure is going to the left, with the exception of, of this structure here. Um, and so this opposite, these are both in the same hemisphere, the north. Uh, I believe the northern. Anyway, um, the um, it turned out that all filaments are either dextral or sinistral. That means right-handed or left-handed as we define them. This is a very exciting um, finding, and although in a few cases it appears that a left-handed or sinistral filament has a right-handed barb, if we have high enough resolution observations, we can see that the threads are actually all going to the left relative to the spine. So here's an enlargement on the right. This image is um, from the Swedish Solar Telescope um, and was uh, uh, selected by uh, a colleague, Yong Lin. The observations were taken by her. Um, but I use it because it is the best example, one of the very best examples that we had for um, showing the fine structure of the filament. So there's a lot of collaborations that exist in people with people in the solar, different solar observatories. Um, so anyway, the, the corality of filaments are the handedness uh, we first discovered at the Big Bear Solar Observatory. Um, and um, uh, that's the uh, next slide. Uh, this shows that the filaments in the middle show a uh, uh, dextral filaments on the right, uh, a schematic of this sinistral filament, uh, excuse me, de uh, dextral filament on the left or sinistral on the right. Um, <clears throat> And we um, began studying a series of um, uh, images um, looking for the corality. And in our initial paper um, from the data from Big Bear Solar Observatory, uh, it was clear that the structure of the chromosphere was aligned with the structure in the filaments. And so the area in the chromosphere around the filaments we call a filament channel. 
So filament channels have the same chirality as the filaments that form in them, not surprising. Um, but the overlying coronal fields um, shown in the bottom slide of this schematic show that the, the uh, coronal field overlying has the opposite um, direction relative to the axis of the filament or the spine of the filament. And so the handedness of the magnetic fields change from the um, filament and the chromosphere as we go into the higher corona. There are structures in between that also um, uh, temporarily form um, in, in what we call the cavity above the filament and uh, below the magnetic fields. There's a region there that is called the cavity. And uh, there's occasionally bright structures occur in that, um, that area. Additionally, when filaments erupt, the, the um, flare loops, those the overlying coronal fields. Um, so these discoveries of uh, both the um, canceling magnetic fields and the chirality of filaments um, were, were primary ones um, that I um, studied at the Big Bear Solar Observatory. Um, um, it turned out though, however, uh, I had an opportunity to leave Big Bear Observatory and establish an, a new organization. And um, at the time, I, I'm not showing images of the telescopes because they're, actually, they're in the exhibit um, that's being shown by your society. So, but um, uh, I started the uh, organization and called it Helio Research. Uh, my husband was a member of the board of directors as well as several um, colleagues uh, from different areas um, of work, not, not solar astronomers. So the board of directors needs to have a board abroad. Uh, but these are not the board of directors. These, at the same time that um, uh, I was beginning work at Helio Research and my husband was building a solar telescope for me um, at our, at our um, home in La Crescenta, uh, a number of colleagues that I had worked with um, over the years, excuse me um, for stopping, um, Um, we've been collaborating with each other in, in, in small groups. And um, we got together and decided that we ought to form a, a larger team um, because it could be more effective in actually writing proposals and getting funding for our research. So seven of us, uh, shown in this image, um, uh, had all been working together. Uh, five of us were ob ob observers, i.e. Karen Harvey, Vic, Jack, myself, Odd Bjorn, and we had two theoreticians, Terry Forbes and Eric Priest. Um, so we formed a team, we called it PROM, it was Eric's idea to call it Prominence Research Obser Observations and Models. And um, uh, so we called it the prom team and we continued to meet and work together for the next 15 years until um, various of us, various members um, began to retire. So is, there's a great advantage, of course, in working with colleagues and especially uh, with people of different backgrounds be, because then we could do things um, like uh, one of the things we had proposed was um, um, we had the opportunity to propose, I should say, uh, to take observations for a whole summer at the Dutch Open Telescope. So the first slide I want to show showing here is um, images from the Dutch Open Telescope. On the left is a filament, as just like we've been seeing on the right, the magnetic fields of the filament and, and um, the Dutch Open Telescope is in the Canary Islands, by the way. Uh, and 
what we um, found in these images was that um, we could see the canceling magnetic fields and relate the canceling magnetic fields to, um, to the filament. So this is really exciting. But we made a new discovery when we started making the movies of H-alpha. And the next movies show you um, they sh show you the um, uh, what we call red wing images and blue wing images. In other words, um, Doppler shifts in the filament. That is, Doppler shifts are mass motions towards us and away from us. And um, you can see in this movie that the mass motions, um, if you, if we were looking at the first movie with just the um, The, fir the first movie with is only um, the single filament by itself is the core of the line. And, and uh, in the core of the line, uh, it looks like the mass motions go back and forth and back and forth all along the axis of the filament. But if we now compare that with the next movie, which shows on the left, the blue image, that is the Doppler shifted to the blue, an image, and on the right, the one that shows Doppler shifted mass uh, to the red wing. The blue wing is mass move, moving for us on the left, mass moving away from us on the right. And you can see that the filament now shows only mass motions um, in one direction in the blue and the opposite direction in the, in the right. And this, this uh, discovery was actually made in another filament by, by Jack Ardbjorn and myself. And what we found, um, uh, how we finally concluded the interpretation was that the mass motions in filaments, this is a typical filament, are not, um, are not just back and forth mass motions all the time along the axis of the filament, but rather they're, the mass motions are in separate threads. They're interleaved and they're flowing in both directions at the same time. This is called counter streaming. And so this was a very puzzling and very fascinating discovery that all filaments have counter streaming. And so of course we studied many, many other examples um, after this. And we also studied the um, canceling fields um, in relation to this particular filament uh, while we we're writing a paper on. The next slide with the, with the magnetograms, um, there's a circle around the canceling magnetic fields. You can see that the fields are gradually disappearing as they come together. Following that is the H alpha image corresponding to exactly the same region. And what we see in here we're, you know, on the left, I'm showing the images in the blue wing. On the right are the images in the red wing. We actually have two, we have, have five wavelengths. So all together, we have the center line and then two images in the red wing uh, close to the center of the line and then two images further into the wing of the line. So we're able to see Doppler shifts of different magnitudes. The further into the wing of the line and the less structure you see actually is the higher the velocity of the mass motions moving towards or away from us. So in the bottom of the H alpha picture, there's a colored superposition of the filament threads, blue and green on the left, red and yellow on the right. So on the left is mass motions moving away from us. Those mass motion, excuse me, mass motions towards us on the right moving away from us. And you see they occupy nearly at the same volume as So this again is evidence that the mass motions leave uh, going both ways. It's sort of like a freeway in which there are individual cars going in both directions, but no lane. Uh, and the particles are, or the vehicles are not colliding with each other. Both foot points completely at the same time. In this example, however, we could identify the foot points of the threads really well because of the high resolution of the observations. 
And so in the next, this magnetogram, um, uh, in the upper right are, are the mass motions going towards, um, towards the sun, i.e. away from us. And, and I've, um, you can see the threads. And in the lower right, there's little dots of the same color where the foot points are. And the same for the, the observations in the blue wing coming um, out of the sun, we see uh, little red and uh, blue and green dots there. And those are the foot points. And the superposition shows that the foot points are clustered around the, the in between opposite polarities exactly where the magnetic flux is disappearing. So this is really true proof of the um, cancellation of magnetic fields causing particles to stream into filaments and um, from one location not seeing the opposite location. We don't know where the ones coming um, into the sun are coming from, but we can clearly see by the red and yellow dots where where the um, are the true foot points of the uh, mass motions that are going um, into the sun and the blue and green the ones coming out of the sun. So there would be there are then very many places where this process is happening. Um, so the conclusion of um, all these uh, different um, works on filaments and prominences at, at the different places that I worked actually led our uh, uh, prom team um, to develop a conceptual model of how and why solar eruptive filaments occur. So a brief summary of this, um, I decided rather than to try to show slides, I simply show and um, and we can go back to um, go back to um, um, real time images. And I will um, at this point pick up the wire model. Excuse me, I have to lean over. And try to show it to you. There we are. Um, can you see it? Uh, can anybody sold the, the model together? And we see then that along the side are the uh, barbs which go from the spine of the filament to the chromosphere. That's on this side, from the from the spine down to the chromosphere. And at the base, at the base is I'm trying to get this right. At the base, uh, there is a magnetogram. So this is actually um, a scale model made after a real filament and real magnetograms at the base. Um, the wires, of course, are the schematic part because we cannot show anywhere near the number of threads that actually exist in the filament. And above, above the filament, we are seeing then um, two magnetic field lines, which are representative of actually the whole corona and the direction of the magnetic field in the corona above the filament. So um, what happens when a filament um, erupts is, well, let's talk about the growth of the filament first. It begins at the photosphere with the canceling magnetic fields, putting mass into the filament. The mass continues always to go into the filament, um, uh, but, but uh, a thread at a time. So, so we see the threads of the filament. The mystery has always been, how does the magnetic field, what forces the, um, the filament to rise during an eruption? And we find um, that the mass motions going along one thread survive one transit, uh, and, then, and then the mass goes back into the photosphere. But the magnetic field that, that has been um, sent into the corona or raised into the corona by the magnetic reconnection of the canceling fields 
remains in the corona, but it's now invisible. So since we cannot directly observe the magnetic fields in the corona, excuse me, I'm trying to see if I can make this any better. Anyway, um, we up. cannot see the fields up here in the corona at all. And we cannot see the invisible, when the, when the mass goes through a filament thread, then leaving the magnetic field. Well, what happens to that invisible magnetic field? Well, actually it, it is trapped by the overlying coronal field. So all it can do is rise into um, this volume underneath the coronal magnetic fields. So there's actually a continuous accumulation of magnetic flux between the upper part of the filament and the, the overlying um, coronal magnetic fields. Sarah, that, thank you very yes. much. Maybe we can take the explicit explanation of how this works if there are coming questions from the audience. And we would now proceed with the panel so that we can get um, uh, uh, several viewpoints on our topic tonight. Okay, that's great. The, uh, um, the, the sentence I should finish is that the accumulating magnetic field in the corona is, is in always increasing. And therefore, it's that magnetic field in the cavity that actually causes the eruption. Okay, so that is actually the end of my talk. <laughs> so uh, I guess I will uh, take it. Uh, thank you very much, Sarah, for this um, exciting and insight. And um, yeah, I'm a, I'm Tytti Rantanen, the program coordinator of Avearki, the Center for Finnish Media Art. And um, in this panel, we will discuss on the images of science used in art or the kind of junction of scientific and artistic images uh, inspired by this uh, photosonic landscapes exhibition in, in the art society where your work is also uh, quite kind of um, quite much in focus uh, in, in Minna Longstrom's work, for instance. So I will very briefly introduce the panelists. We just heard a presentation by Sarah Martin, a solar astronomer based in California, USA, and the executive director of Helio Research. And I have three artists here. Also, for you who have, who have just joined this uh, live stream, I will introduce Minla Longström, a media artist and filmmaker from Helsinki, Finland. Her artistic work uh, consists of participatory cinematic installations, short films and documentaries. And before this exhibition, she made a documentary film, The Other Side of Mars, and I guess it was in the process of making this documentary film where you also met Sarah for the, for the first time. But now for this exhibition, you have made a new installation called Photosphere, where you interviewed Sarah. And then we have uh, Leah Bieferman, an American artist working with landscape through digital image making, photography, video, checks and sound. And Leah is currently based in Providence, USA, where she is an adjunct lecturer at Brown University and a critic at Rhode Island School of Design. I'm a little bit jealous because I think that Providence is such a beautiful town that I would love to be there as well. But yeah, uh, Leah's new working, uh, new uh, moving image work, The Elements, is also seen in this exhibition at, at Solo Space in Helsinki. And then uh, we have also third artist here, Mika Tanila. Welcome, thank you for joining us. Uh, Mika Tanila is a filmmaker and artist based in Helsinki. And he works with documentary arts and we in man-made machines or man-machines, uh, which are like recurring themes in his films and installations. So we thought that there might be some some um, interesting um, meeting points here. And 
I will start uh, with presenting some questions for Sarah. And then the artists can join the discussion and I have, I have some questions for the artists as well. But again, explain like what kind of, of role do the hue or tone of the coloring and the focus of images play in your research? Oh, um, they're everything. Um, <laughs> Uh, since the sun is far far away, um, our really our only means of studying it is either by space probes, which of course is happening all the time now. Uh, there's a lot of solar experiments in space, um, or by direct ob observation from solar observatories. And uh, so the images are are everything. If we didn't have the images, we wouldn't. Um, um, we might know of the existence of solar flares. We might be able to deduce it from their effects on the Earth, but that's very indirect and very difficult to um, do. And you, it can be done with other instrumentation that detect particles. Uh, for a long time, it's been known that the aurora is um, comes from events on the sun, but we would have no idea what those events are like if we didn't have images. So if you look through a solar telescope um, with, a, with a hydrogen filter, the image is all red. And so we use false color to represent Doppler shifts or, or simply to you know, um, show some distinctions between different features. So we use the color as sort of a, you know, it's both an artistic and, and useful uh, means. Mm. of differentiating velocities. So we can have color represent something. In our case, our most common use is to represent the velocities and the direction of flows on the sun. So the, the function of color is to make things more visible and to kind of create distinctions between different phenomena on that image. Yes, yes. yes. Cool. Yes, especially mass motions coming towards and away from us. Yeah, it's, uh, it's fascinating. Um, and also in, in Minna's installation, um, there is this very kind of fascinating um, kind of connection to the film industry and Hollywood that Minna brings up. Like, um, she brings up that um, actually the, your research had a maybe surprising contact with the Hollywood laboratories and film industry as the films were developed there. So um, how do you recall this proximity of Hollywood and its industry of images, like commercial entertainment images now, like related to your research? Yeah, at the Lockheed Observatory, it was very important because then it was not necessary to process films and time-lapse films. Of course, you're taking maybe a couple hundred feet of 35 millimeter film every day um, on every camera that you're using. And so we're often using two, three, four cameras at the same time. So um, for Lockheed, uh, the Lockheed Solar Group, it was really important because um, it saved a lot of time and actually it was less expensive to have the films processed in Hollywood than it was to, you know, um, have our own developing system at the observatory. But most of observatories, the National Solar Observatory at Sacramento Peak at that time, uh, where the chief observer had, had worked before, um, that was on the top of a mountain and they had no choice other than to develop their own films. Yeah, And so they actually had to always have uh, one or more persons that did nothing else than develop films and keep them organized. Yeah. Um, but now, um, now you are using like digital cameras. Is it correct? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I, almost every place uses digital cameras um, uh, because of the ease and manipulation. Well, both taking the data and manipulating the images after the fact. It's being able to work with the images in different ways that, you know, makes the digital images so so valuable. 
not any more beautiful, but <laughs> um, that's where we are in our technology today. Yeah, I was just going to ask, and, and this uh, this one is also for the artist. If if you if you have some insight or op opinion on this particular uh, topic, but but yeah, film film stock like celluloid played such a crucial role in your uh, solar astronomic research, and and after all, analogic film is is all about photo photochemistry. And uh, the Finnish filmmaker Aki Kaurismäki has said that the real film stock is light and digital film is like, like electronics. And I think that in the film, <laughs> film culture there is this strong kind of emphasis and, and nostalgia over uh, celluloid. But are you, uh, as a solar astronomer, are you nostalgic over celluloid and this drama of light? Is there something lost in the transi transition to the digital image? Or, or something gained? When, when the um, transition was being made to digital cameras, there was a huge loss because uh, the, high, the resolution of the digital images was nowhere near as high as that of the film. Um, however, as cameras have improved over the years, um, uh, it's really difficult to say that the, uh, the the digital images can actually be better than the film when it comes to getting high resolution, and high resolution is all important in being able to um, decipher uh, the nature of the structures on the sun. Yeah. Um, so there's not much aesthetic attachment to film these days. Um, so. Um, for me, it doesn't, it doesn't really make that much difference, um, whether it's grain, film grains or pixels that we're looking at. Um, and the cameras also have a, a wider uh, dynamic range than they used to have. So um, we used to have to take multiple digital images to show the same dynamic range as you can get on film. But now that's reversed. The, the, we can get higher dynamic range in digital images than we can get in film. Yeah. Um, do, do some of you artists want to um, comment on, on this film versus digital uh, debate that is always going on? OK. Mina is oh yeah, can you hear me now? Yes. Yeah, no, I can hear. just maybe say that I guess it's the same for artists and filmmakers um, that uh, people were struggling in the early days of video, um, and um, now uh, you can do so much with with video that uh, uh, it's pretty much. I mean, it's the situation is quite similar. So. Uh, of course, um, there's always the materiality, and you can always choose to use. Um, you know, I think in in that sense, it's different because um, filmmakers can choose to use film, um, and they maybe do it to a larger extent than the astronomers would. Next question is also like mainly for Sarah, but oh, okay, Mika, yes, please. Uh, Hi, just a short comment here to continue what uh, uh, Mina Mina just said that. Uh, uh, I think uh, my my take on the materiality or the choosing between digital or uh, analog medium is uh, depending on on the original source. Um, when I'm working with scientific images, it's always so-called found footage. So whether it's if if the footage is originally on celluloid, then I try to keep it on celluloid as long as possible and maintain that that uh, realm and then on, on the other hand i also work with uh, uh, analog video and digital video. so i have no preference or nostalgia but i try to maintain faithful the, to the original source as long as possible yeah that's a method in itself kind of yeah mm -hmm. uh but yeah so so this question is uh, also for sarah but uh you can also comment on that, the, the, the rest of you. So, um, as you said, uh, the images are everything in, in solar astronomy, but 
with scientific images, we, we rarely get a direct access to the subject. Uh, despite what President Trump did, it is dangerous to stare at the sun with your bare eyes or, or the solar eclipse. You shouldn't do that really. Uh, so, so for the, like, and of course you need a telescope to get information from the sun. But also in, in science, there are like some objects like, like uh, coronavirus, for instance, that are too small to, to perceive without special instruments. So there is always this kind of mediate, mediatedness in the scientific image. So uh, do you find this mediatedness uh, inspiring or frustrating? Or do you consider it? Oh, uh, I just consider it part of the work. Um, uh, making illustrations uh, and making them effective is um, requires doing a lot to them and knowing what you can do and how to do it is um, is as much of the science as science is taking the images in the first place. Um, so um, it's, it's just necessary. Uh, and of course, it can be frustrating because, um, you know, if uh, what you're trying to see, you don't have the dynamic range to see it. Um, but, you know, all instrumentation has this is that um, you, you're either limited to certain wavelengths, like um, I was only showing H alpha. There's all these other wavelengths on, on the sun. And if you want to intercompare them, um, you have to, you know, have lots of instrumentation looking at all of these different lines at the same time. So we're actually doing that now in space with the Solar Dynamics Observatory. Um, so we can compare our H alpha images. And this is, um, oh, I, anyway, probably more than half of solar images uh, now somehow include space images as well. So we do lots and lots of correlations with um, space images because we never can see as much as we want to see as many wavelengths and as many things, um, so many things happening at the same time. And then there's the problem of scale. How do you study very small scale things in relation to the very large scale of the same structures? And typically you have to have separate cameras, separate images just to study things of a different scale. So, um, yeah, it's, um, but I just accept it as, you know, part of the work is, is figuring out how you're going to manipulate your images and what you can do to them. And how about you artists? Do you, do you sometimes have this kind of uh, yearning for total image? Well, uh, I just wanted to ask a little, uh, to add a little one one um, thing to that. That uh, I think that there's something paradoxical um, with these images, uh, you know, that are used in in um, science. And in my earlier film, I was um, looking at this Mars image imagery, and and you had so many people doing so many different things to these images. And so, in a way, one can find a paradox in there that that um, on the one hand you can do, so you can kind of extend your vision. You can see more uh, when you use uh, all these um, tools that we have with the photographic tools, um, uh, like the 16 cameras on the, on the Mars rover and all the different filters they have and everything. And, and then also all the programs and you know, things that are nowadays available. So, so in, in a way the scientist can see so much more than, than one could, you know, be, if we would be standing in that environment um, so there's on the one hand you can see more but then um, but then we also at the same time we actually see less than we think <laughs> so there is also this <laughs> sense that we we nowadays maybe have this idea that you know because of all the imagery and you know that the saturation of images in our culture that we are actually seeing everything for example on mars or some some remote place that we can we, we can only see through through cameras but then um it's uh, it becomes quite quickly evident if you work with those images that um they also are not covering everything like so 
Yeah, um, that's actually a perfect segue to what I wanted to say, um, which is that, I mean, the whole kind of, I think the whole conceptual structure for my work really came from this exact thing that scientific images are mediated and um, that we are using these devices to see things that we could never actually see with our own eyes. And I think, um, I mean, it's it's uh, it's funny for me. I mean, this is an interesting. Um, I mean, being in context of the BioArt Society for this panel is interesting because since the the where I shot my video is in this very remote place on Earth, where it happens that a lot of Finnish artists have been there because the BioArt Society runs this residency there. But being from the United States, basically, very few people that I will ever meet here will ever go to this place where I went. And so to me, there's an equivalent between, you know, we are using this, these cameras to look at the sun where we can never go. And I sort of like have this, um, I don't know, I feel like I've started to think about myself as being this kind of intermediating device <laughs> or like person between this extremely remote place that most people will never go and, uh, the, and and you know through the images and the idea that we can learn about something through images is really fascinating to me um, and that you know even though I'm only working with a pretty regular camera um, that takes pretty regular images um, is you know still that you know just this idea that that we can look at these things and learn something about what we are seeing even if we can never actually see them is, um, is really interesting to me. And so that kind of, th this question, and then you can even, I mean, I'm applying that to remoteness on earth, but you can apply that probably to, you know, any kind of image, um, which is that, you know, uh, if you're not there for the taking of the image, <laughs> the image is sort of automatically separated from you. And, to take it one step further then is also that, uh, you know, there's a story that I always tell from when, an early uh, a trip I was on eight years ago up to the, up even further north in the Arctic and standing next to someone on the trip who was a geologist and feeling like she's seeing this landscape totally differently than I am because she studied geology. And so those two things combined feeling like, you know, we ourselves are these mediating devices of what we see. And I feel like, like learning about scientific images has become just a really helpful model for me to understand all of the different kind of mediating levels that we, that we have in our, in our lives. And it can be the sun or it can be the thing that we're looking at, you know, every day or be campus CRV. <laughs> You're, you're muted. Oh, we can't hear you. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's a beautiful thought now that um, we have mainly images left from the remote places we cannot visit right now. Actually. Um, I have a question for, for all of you three artists. A quick round. You have all somehow somehow combined science or scientific images with your art and artistic praxis. So what was your path to these topics and what do you find most fascinating with scientific imagery? Anyone can start? Mm -hmm. I guess I can start since I was just talking about it. I mean, it, um, yeah, when I, um, it's a long story, but the short version is, is that I got, um, I did get really interested in, in these solar or spacecraft or probes that are flying around looking at stuff for us. And um, that led me to the images that they were taking. And when I was in grad school, I was doing a lot of work around this that was much more kind of directly about it. Um, and uh, 
for some of the, at some point I started getting back, I started, you know, doing a lot of Google searches and finding, you know, different specter graphs or like graphs that were being sent back from these machines and feeling really interested in the fact that, um, I mean, this could go for a graph, but it could also go for these images that Sarah was showing us that, you know, when you, when you send, when you, when you have an image, um, if, a, if someone is trained in reading that image, it means one thing. And if you're not trained in reading that image, it means something else. It's kind of an abstraction almost. And the idea that something could be simultaneously informational and abstract to me was just like really mind blowing. <laughs> and, uh, and it became, it's just become the foundation for everything that I've done pretty much. And, and sort of how, and there's a lot of branches out from that in a lot of different ways, but um, yeah, the idea that, and so, you know, um, and we can talk about this more later, but the way that I play with form in my work is, is to try to both let something be what it is, but also to make it kind of abstract at the same time to sort of play with like, what is this thing that we're actually looking at? It's not whatever. Um, and so that, yeah, that kind of conceptual point came straight from those scientific images and I'm still still fascinated by it. Yeah. Every, everyone sees uh, images differently. Everyone sees something in them differently. And even ourselves, we go back, I think this is in your artwork, you show that, well, you go back to the same place and you see something different. And that was the case um, in our discovery of the chorality of solar images. That it was possible to finally recognize the right-handed and left-handed forms of, of them. So it required high resolution. But if you then, once you recognize it, you go back and you look at those same, um, you look at all different images and you see all the previous images differently because now you can see the hints of chorality that were there all the time. And some examples were very clear, but were never picked up. And so there's something that happens, you know, in your mind that suddenly you see something you didn't see before. And um, with Corral, yeah, and of course that's the same for ideas, ideas, but um, that was especially clear when we discovered the chorality of solar images. And then once we discovered one in, in filaments, of course, then we went searching for it in everything else that we could see all other solar images and there it was. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Go ahead. You are muted still. Sorry. Uh, I think uh, what I find uh, uh, most I interesting or fascinating with scientific images is uh, the way us about our values and dreams what we hope for and what kind of, what kind of uh, future we are dreaming and, and uh, building. Uh, and uh, other thing is that I'm very uh, very keen on the on the situation where images and also sounds when they are taken from their original context and put uh, rearranged and put them a little bit in a different context. In my case, uh, a cinematic context or visual art context uh, and uh, sometimes I think of scientific images a little bit like uh, uh, parallel to what what uh, what had been happening in pop art in the 60s 70s 80s even today uh, like uh, when people uh, started making what we call pop art they took images of uh, consumer culture TV culture comics uh, advertising and so on and rearranged them and and uh, and put them somewhere else. And so I think there's plenty of uh, space and, and room and potential and many, many good reasons to do the same for scientific images and sounds as well. Um, yeah, um, I, for, my, for me also, um, there's many, many reasons why I'm, I'm interested in, um, in the scientific images. Um, it also has to do with uh, things I studied, um, like always kind of 
at the same time as doing art, uh, have been uh, studying or, or just reading uh, philosophy of science and perception and, um, and of, um, of basically um, how, we, how we use images. And um, so, and also worked kind of with um, projects that are, have explored some natural science or something since, um, you know, since I've ever, like, ever since I studied or, or became an artist. I can't really say um, when or what specifically would interest me, but um, I, in these past two, two projects, it's been very specific. Like I kind of focused on in that Mars film, I focused on completely on this on this subject. Um, it's like it's a kind of a investigation into the image. I felt, um, and you know, it could have been any other subject. It would happen to be Mars exploration because. Uh, you know, you have, it's, you watch an artist, it kind of mixes together uh, your life and, you know, where you happen to be. So you, you also kind of stumble on things. So, so, so I'm kind of uh, projected um, ideas on, or like kind of did this research on what, what an image can be and um, by studying this um, Mars and um, Mars exploration, the history of it. And starting to research the project in like 2014 and then the film was finished in 2019 um, I I kind of went through this whole process of of um, I just I understood that what, at the same time when I was looking into the history and of uh, of Mars observation um, I also learned something about our like humans relationship to to cameras and to photography and it's very very fascinating to see all these different uh, how all these different uh, photographic technologies are um, kind, of, kind of compared to each other and how we relate also differently to them. For example, that um, when a picture that depicts something, um, even if that what it depicts is actually less information than, let's say, uh, a spectrograph, which uh, it's a te photographic technology that was kind of used long before we had pictures of, of, uh, of other planets like Mars. We knew uh, very, very a lot about these planets because of this other photographic te uh, technology, which is not really um, depicting it, like a landscape or something. So we can, as Leo just said also, was, you know, you cannot see it, you cannot recognize. It's just for the layman, it's just a bunch of lines. And um, so, so for example, like um, you had the um, the first picture of, of the of the uh, planet taken from by a from a um, spacecraft of Mars was like 1965, and in my film I also explained that uh, one year before that was like the most um, complete uh, spectrograph taken of the, or the best spectrograph taken ever of the of the planet's con consistency so so they were able to tell already that they cannot be like exist uh, kind of uh, large scale uh, life on 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 the planet uh, and this was one year before but it didn't get almost any attention uh, than as as like as much as the picture the physical picture uh, showing like a landscape uh, later uh, one year later only which was kind of used as the proof uh, that you know mars is as as dead as the moon basically so and the, yeah just just one thing to add on that is um I mean, it's interesting because before before i started working with photographic images which was like eight years ago i was making work using found scientific graphs actually um, and kind of making pieces that use them in ways that they appeared abstract, so they had no numbers or anything on them. And it was interesting because I feel like, you know, there were people who wanted to engage those images just like as visual objects, as art objects, but then there were definitely people who would look at them and say, oh, that's scientific, I can't understand that. And I'm not even mm -hmm. really gonna try. And even, I wasn't trying to communicate anything scientific, I was actually trying to do the opposite, which is say like, mm -hmm. this is this is visual information that you can engage with. It doesn't have to mean something in order for you to engage with it. 
but it's interesting hearing that Mars, you know, image story because um, people are really, uh, and it makes sense. I mean, photography because it mirrors the way that we see with our own eyes. And when you start using all of these other devices, um, some people just aren't interested in trying to make sense of something that they can't actually see themselves. And, you know, I mean, I think that there's like all kinds of ethical reasons why people need to learn how to see things other than how they see things <laughs> with their <laughs> own eyes. <laughs> and I, I always present scientific yeah. images to my students in that framework too, but, but it is kind of interesting, uh, you know, and, and when I use photography with, I try to fool with it, you know, I'm like, it's not what you think it is. It's something a little bit different. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, and I think that, um, yeah, I mean, space images are kind of an exception because I think a lot of people are willing to just say, oh, it's outer space, it's beautiful. I don't have to understand it. I can just look at it and it's a pretty picture of a galaxy or a planet or the sun or whatever. Um, and, um, but, you know, it's on some level that all of these images are the same because <laughs> they're all taken through something. They're all seen by something kind of other than ourselves. <laughs> As someone with background in, in humanities, I can kind of relate to this uh, shyness uh, before the scientific images. But Minna, would you like to now show some photos of your installation in the exhibition? Well, can, could Matteo perhaps put on the slides or the pictures? Or um, do they show? Or should it work as a screen share? Well, the thing is, he, he, I couldn't get it to work, so he was supposed ah. to do it. But uh, yeah, there, there they are. Okay, so um, so my um, yeah, the way. Well, basically, we have a show together with Leah in in uh, the Bio Art Society's uh, uh, gallery solo, and uh, it's kind of uh, a little bit like a product. Uh, project space in a way. Uh, so we felt that we could, um, it was kind of nice to do a project, like a bit maybe small, smaller project where um, where we, in a, in a kind of an experimental way a little bit. So uh, for me, it was really great to be able to actually include some of the, uh, some of the research and put it into the other room. And uh, so what I have there is uh, are two, um, two projections. One is a video film um, that I filmed of um, Sarah, um, you know, mounting the her um, her telescope, and also, and I'm kind of um, I have two things. It's kind of a um, a, a video a, a piece where I'm trying to say something very simple. She's uh, talking about the Path Pathé Laboratory, uh, which her colleague uh, Harry Ramsey uh, formed a, an alliance with. Um, it was in Hollywood Hills and it's actually in the it's in the film like the film footage, the old film footage you can see the building saying Pathé Laboratories and that film half of the film is showing kind of it's made maybe in the early 60s or something and it's showing uh, the old like how films used to be processed earlier, like in the early 1900s. And then um, now, like in that film, they're showing how it's happening in the, in the modern times and how huge machines they have on all this work, you know, and all these great basins and things that they, the film has to travel through and all these machines. So what I wanted to achieve with this is kind of to, and that, so then I'm showing some pictures, like some parts of those, those films. And um, I also took away the, the voiceover of the man explaining what's happening and I just put in instead um, like this uh, poly sounds so I tried to kind of uh, make it really material so that you know when film is traveling through you can hear the sound of the film you hear you know when they are doing something and then um, then I have also the same thing with Sarah like I also tried to kind of take those the haptic sounds of, of using like working with the telescope and then she's in the headphones, which is a different soundtrack, um, she is then explaining about how she used films uh, and also about this process of, of making the connection with the film labs. And 
So, and then I have the films, Sarah's films themselves also project, like possible to see in, in both in the film and the, uh, the video, or like as a film projection. So it's the original film that Sarah kindly sent me. Um, and then I have some information about Sarah, but, but also what I also have <laughs> are some, some kind of uh, research about this lab. You know, it was quite nice to actually find the exact location where it exists in Hollywood and, um, you know, maybe some old advertisements and things like that from that. So it was, it was just su such a sweet project to work on because it was, you know, just this little, you know, this detail, which is disappearingly small detail, if, if you think of the scope of Sarah's work, which I think we just got, uh, uh, you know, we, we sensed the magnitude of it <laughs> uh, during her, her talk. So, so this is just, I know it's just a small detail, um, but for me, it just seems really fascinating and interesting how, how, science, how she can use, uh, you know, images and, and also like kind of camera technology and, and really be knowledgeable about that, you know, uh, because she has to be, able to be able to take those pictures and, and, um, and you know, how, how someone can use the same medium and do, do it so differently and look at the images so differently. It's, it's just somehow, you know, it doesn't cease to fascinate me. So. Yeah, I really enjoyed the philosophical and epistemological element, just like in in the other side of Mars, your your documentary film, and then there is historical, cultural, historical uh, aspect that you just explained to us. But also, in in addition to these these um, aspects or elements, uh, I think what is also interesting in this uh, installation, photosphere. And also in in the other side of Mars, is that you actually uh, also very beautifully portray or you produce images of astronomers whose work is to again produce images from locations that are otherwise beyond our reach uh, as an individuals. So uh, first of all, is there some some face or some, some element in their work that fascinates you the most as an artist? And secondly, do you also also want to have some impact on the visual tradition of portraying science and scientists? Well, um, yeah, the, maybe the part that, um, that I kind of went left, that my point of departure for the um, Mars film, but also in some sense, I mean, I think it's the same same for Sarah, uh, is that um, the, the main person in, in the Mar Mars film was um, Vandy Verma, who, who is, um, she's now been promoted to, <laughs> to uh, uh, chief of engineering of the ro robotics technology in, uh, in NASA, like the, in JPL um, at the Mars missions. And, but one of her important, um, or one of her tasks uh, when the la latest uh, Mars um, rover landed was to be a Mars rover driver. So, which means that you, through all these cameras or specific cameras, you navigate in the in the environment. And what started to fascinate me and why I then decided to make this film because it was actually some years after, like two years after they had actually landed, and I never. I never managed to make a film just about Mars exploration. That was not, but it was when I understood the extent to which she's actually using images uh, in that work. And also what fascinated me even more was um, the fact that even though they have a lot of images and you can go into this, uh, NASA has its own image um, kind of a department that is nowadays focused only in images. It's, uh, you know, it's kind of image, image science um, archive where, you know, you can find everything from the past and the present also. And, um, and those images fascinate me that, that she can actually, because they spent maybe like a day or two on, or three or more, one, maybe a week on one rock. So she can, so the distances between things in some sense, that complete understanding nobody else has on the planet, you know, like, or like than these people, it's, it's after all, not that many people who are doing that, that job. So, so that was what fascinated me uh, quite much. And, you know, I was thinking that, yeah, um, this, there could be material for a film here. So, um, 
Yeah. Uh, um, and then uh, maybe we should move to Lia's work in the exhibition, the video, the elements. Um, there is this voiceover that consists of your poetical or philosophical reflections on perception, weather observations and measuring. But then uh, what was also very delightful was the visual composition, which is some, some kind of a cyclical alternation of a fog or cloud-like whiteness or blank, and then landscapes from Lapland, and then this very mesmerizing mosaic-like images of landscapes combined of different layers of landscape imagery, like, yeah, yeah, it's a very kind of mosaic-like. Uh, did you have some specific mention? For instance, at first, the mosaic is almost seamless. I didn't notice at first, but then it becomes more and more visible and kind of rough. Yeah, um, <clears throat> maybe I'll while I talk about this. Um, so, is this, it, can we see? Um, so yeah, this is the this is the video piece in the exhibition at Solu right now, um, and I'll talk about these sort of posters in a minute. Um, but this is the opening shot of the video, and it's it, well, it's moving, and this is a still. All of these are stills that I'm showing. Um, but I guess there's sort of two. I mean, there's there's several things going on in this in this piece. Um, that I wanted to try to highlight. And, and one of them is sort of what I started to talk about before, um, which is, you know, me being this person who's who's sort of trying to communicate this landscape that most people aren't actually going to visit themselves. Um, and then sort of simultaneously recognizing that there's a limit to what an image is able to communicate. So that's kind of one part of it, which is why there's all this text. Um, another part of it is, um, I'll just page through and show some other stills while I'm talking. Um, another part of it is sort of trying to think about what the difference might be between scientific observation or scientific description and artistic or personal description or observation. And, um, you know, so pulling in all of this information about whether um, some of it is stuff that I was observing and writing about as I was there. Um, and some of it was, you know, weather data about Kilpis RV. Some of it was weather data from other planets. Uh, there's this whole section on Saturn's moon Titan. There's some stuff about solar wind and wind coming from black holes and wind on other planets. Um, and so that was... Um, I think on one level that was my attempt to kind of bring this place or, or treat this place <clears throat> like a planet because we live on earth and earth is a planet. And I think we have a tendency <clears throat> to not recognize or not really sort of remember. We think about planets, you think about Saturn and Mars and Jupiter. Um, and but we don't, I mean, we, we kind of all know that earth is a planet but we don't think about it in the same way because we live here. And I think um, being somewhere this remote for me is one way to think about how, just, just to reflect upon the planetary systems that are, that are going on. Um, and then in terms of these, um, as you call them, the mosaic qualities of these images that are, so they're all, um, there's many shots in the video that are double layers. Uh, so there's two images that are being overlaid on top of one another or sort of one image is cut out to reveal the other image is really what's happening. And it took me a long time to go through all of the video that I had shot um, last summer and figure out what image should go with what, what video should go with what, because there's obviously kind of the composition um, to keep in mind, but also um, the images do happen in chronological order over the course of the video. So having to kind of keep them grouped with grouped in time, um, but then to have these different kind of views make sense. But the reason that, um, and then there's a number of just straight shots as well, like this one um, and like this one, which are moving images. Um, but 
you know, these double layer images are, I mean, they're, they're, I do them for a few reasons. And one is to really um, sort of point out that when you look at a landscape, you're, you're, I mean, really when you look at anything, but I'm always working with landscape. When you look at landscape, you're sort of taking in multiple things at once. And you're never just really just looking off in one direction. You're either feeling something, you're feeling wind, you're looking at multiple things, or you're thinking about what you just saw in relation to what you're currently seeing. And so having these, um, having these, these, these kind of layered um, images, it, it allows for that kind of multiplicity of perspective. Um, and it also provides a place for me as a visual artist, as someone who comes from a background in drawing, to bring my hand into this kind of observational psychological space and to remind you that actually the thing that's doing the looking here is, is you know, it's my camera, but it's also me. And so the, um, the use of the voiceover is another way to kind of assert my presence in the, as the, as the kind of translating um, individual, the translating person from this landscape to you. Um, and it's also a way for me to bring in things that um, you can't see with a camera. And so, um, so yeah, just, uh, I think I can, yeah, I can go back really quickly um, to, the, to the beginning. But something that's interested me a lot with all of this work is the relationship between image and language. And you know, when we listen to Sarah's talk, um, you know, those images mean way more to me listening to Sarah speak about them than if I was just looking at them on my own. And I've, I think that there's, I've played with a lot in my work, sometimes giving no text and sometimes giving a lot of text. So this idea of wind and the wind is coming from the north, but there's also wind on stars or solar wind or um, stellar wind. And, um, and then finally that these words in themselves conjure up images in our minds. And, um, you know, that a visual image is a kind of image, but a textual image is another kind of image and I'm really, I've been fascinated reading scientific texts of different kinds, the, the different sorts of images that come up in my mind of things that I'll never be able to see. And that you can, you can have a phrase like the luminous winds of hot massive stars and you can still conjure up a picture of what that might look like. Um, so let's see if I can stop my screen. So, um, so yeah, so there's a, it's a, it's a, it's a complex piece for me. Um, it like puts together a lot of different things I've been thinking about for several years and Kilpis Yarvi got to be the home <laughs> for all of these ideas um, to kind of land, which was nice. Yeah, that's um, like a very kind of interesting way to approach landscape to kind of slice it to, to different pieces. But um, I think I will move to Mika, who has been there so patiently and kindly <laughs> uh, there uh, in, in his window. Uh, maybe you could also show some, some photos of your earlier work, but in general, you have used kind of found science or scientific found footage in several of your works, as you already mentioned, like in, in a physical ring the zone of total eclipse or twilight. Mm, what makes, for you, what makes a found scientific footage artistically stimulating or how do you recognize a good found, a good find, sorry? Well, uh, it's easy, it's not easy to, uh, not easy to recognize. In my opinion, I, I come across scientific images a lot and uh, I get ideas for a potential film or installation or collage or whatever. But most of the ideas I delete or forget immediately because they are not going anywhere. And sometimes one idea might be uh, revolving in my uh, head one day or two days. But maybe something like one week is a good threshold that if a, a specific image or set of images and sounds uh, keep on uh, enchanting 
uh, or something like that for one week or over one week and it's time to go go on and go forward with, and try to do something with the with the material and first of all try to find out what is the original context now usually in these works you mentioned they've been very old uh, old materials from many decades back so it's essential to try to find as uh, clearly as possible the original context and reason and historical fact it's it's hard to verbalize fully or in a in a precise way but that's the motor or the or the is essence of the whole whole work and uh, the facts are very important uh, even though in my case they are not uh, uh, like very uh, clearly put in the in the final result of the of the work or there is an installation or film they have been, I, I'll give out some basic facts but I, I don't want to uh, explain the full scientific story. It's more about imagination and, and sending something off and, and letting go. But in the process of making, the historical facts are very important. I'm fascinated with the basic situation where camera is used as a measurement tool, not as an artistic uh, device. Yeah. This scientific material, to me, I kind of... Uh, no one is trying to express anything. No one has any motivation to describe or portray their inner feelings when there is a fear or emotions. It's just uh, for the practical uh, reasons of science. And when that uh, material is uh, put in a little bit different context, in a different order, collage, rearrangement or something like that, then I find this uh, friction. What, what uh, possibly happens, I find it very uh, stimulating in, in artistic sense. So maybe I'll show also a couple of projects you mentioned. I put on the share. Yeah, uh, yeah this uh, first work, work is a video installation called Hamara Twilight in English. And it's um, based on uh, scientific footage made in Helsinki University. And uh, they are doing experiments with, uh, with uh, frogs in different uh, kind of, uh, uh, in, in a laboratory situation. And uh, they are, what they are doing is a research of how the amount, different amount of light is simply affecting the reaction of their uh, hunting for food. There's a uh, rubber, uh, uh, rubber band or rubber band that looks like an assembly line. And when, the, when there's uh, little light, then of course the reaction is slow. And when it's more brighter, then it's uh, faster. And what I did is a video installation for two uh, video projectors that are moving. They are very, very slowly moving, like the rubber uh, band in the in the footage. The original footage is the uh, analog video VHS, and here it's uh, shown in a couple of uh, exhibitions. And they are going back and forth on these uh, these, and this original uh, footage is silent, and also uh, I did not add any sound, so it's a quiet, rather quiet, uh, contemplative, meditative installation piece. Uh, the second one is an older piece from 19, original footage from 1945 of a, a solar eclipse shot here in, uh, in Finland, in Kokkola, uh, uh, by uh, the Finnish Geodetic Institute in Poroluoto. And it's an example I think what I discovered when I came first came uh, uh, professors who work there now they had several meetings with them and they gave me to happened in forty five, and it's a an failed experiment. Every everything failed in scientific sense. Uh, they they were what they were trying to do is to uh, use a movie camera and a sound recorder to measure. Uh, to synchronize uh, 
later on and with the synchronization and very complex mathematical calculation the idea was to uh, measure the distance between Europe and North America to two continents but they were shooting at wrong film speed the, they didn't know how to properly use the cameras and so on so it's uh, useless in scientific sense uh, some years later they did uh, they managed to do a, a successful experiment but this footage and also the original sounds are from the a failed experiment. So I'm also fascinated with these kind of uh, attempts and dreams and hopes for the technological uh, innovations. And, and in this case, also the historical context is rather interesting. It was July 45 and uh, the Second World War War was just about to uh, end so it's not very hard to guess why several people were interested in uh, discovering uh, the exact distance there are a lot of runes in europe and other <laughs> parts of the world and uh, and simply for for military use this kind of information was uh, also useful and the third example, here's the installation in Kiasma with two 60 millimeter, it's a six minute film loop. And the third example you mentioned is a piece called Physical Ring. Experiment in Finland, uh, 1940s, and uh, 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 materials and, uh, and people working at the university doing same kind of uh, attempts uh, today. And I came across, uh, heard many uh, explanations but basically every time different explanation so i gave up and i really don't know what is being experimented here i present it as a short film or as an as a site-specific uh, video installation maybe you could have we had in in finland in the 1980s this tv show called the liars club where you tried to find the best explanation or the wildest explanation for some objects so maybe you could have that one with the physical ring yes exactly <laughs> well i tell you that could be slide you can, you can come up yeah. with yeah <laughs> but uh you mentioned the word fascination many times and you are also kind of um it, it seems that you are you are uh, very often also fascinated with with the history of experimental film and when we were when i when i was inviting you to this panel you very keenly brought up the, um, the scientific films by Jean, which you have also uh, presented previously at Doc Point Documentary Film Festival. And um, I read from the, from the materials you, you sent me that you, you brought up that Jean Pain Levé was, was really not appreciated or acknowledged in the academic circles. So in a way, his films were kind of scientific if not useless, but not, not like appreciated that much, but very much um, like warmly welcomed by, by the contemporary audience like surrealists in, in Paris, uh, precisely because of his kind of sense of drama and, and, and sensuality uh, in his films on sea urchins, octopuses, seahorses. What was for you the kind of the initial inspiration or spark with Pan Leves films? Well, yes, it's true. I'm very fond of Pan uh, and uh, I think it's uh, simply uh, humor, horror and confusion. The scientific films, but they are orthodox in a way that they combine many other things. And they, I think that's... Uh, why they were, uh, back in the days, in the 20s and 30s, 40s, they were not uh, really considered as, as serious scientific films for research, but more more for a wider audience and mixing different genres. For the pan uh, described that there are uh, three kinds of scientific films. Uh, films for scientific community, for scientists, these hardcore research films. And secondly, films for lectures and third uh, popular science films so uh, Pan, what Pan Leve did himself was uh, the latter popular science films for uh, cinema audience many of his films were actually shown as short films before feature films 
uh, at different cine clubs and and cinema distribution in, in, around, and some of them very very popular, like uh, the Va Vampire, which was a great great hit film. He loved uh, Pan Leve, loved this. Uh, abstract, silent, very long uh, research films, but he thought it's also space for uh, surrealist, uh, humoristic and, and offbeat science films. Music played a big films, and there was a kind of a personal kind of very, very situation in many of his films. Um, I'm not sure if we have time to look at the excerpt because I think we are running a little bit late. But, um, or, or would you want to show that? Erich, do we have some time? What do you think? Mastermind behind the panel. I'm not sure. If Tutti, I will leave the, will leave that to you. Yeah? Okay, um, maybe we can take a look at it because it was a quite short excerpt. Yes, it's a two minute uh, clip, and I think it's, it's a combination. Before, uh, Matteo, uh, we are ready to watch the short clip in uh, 30 seconds. I say a few words before that. And it's a, it's a, it's a kind of almost like a trailer of uh, the oeuvre, and almost like a trailer of uh, the oeuvre or the um, uh, films of Leve. Ben Leve did over 200 films and he's been discovered in a major way, having retro retrospectives last year on Toronto TIFF Festival and there's a restorations of his films being made and this is for that uh, practical reason this uh, this uh, collage is, is made. So I think uh, yeah. we could watch it. Yeah. I will have one final question for all of you. Great, so come on, go go on, Matteo. These are images from the films of Jean Panlevé. They are beautiful nightmares that tread the line between science and fiction. Jean Panlevé was a filmmaker whose influential films are notable for the fusion of scientific observation, modern optics and an avant-garde sensibility. He was inspired by the works of Jean Commandant and Etienne Jules Marais. In a career spanning over 60 years, Jean Panlevé had made more than 200 films that spanned various genres from fiction to documentary to scientific research to stop-motion animation. His most recognizable film is The Seahorse. We are the Documents Cinematographique. We're an organization founded by Jean Panlevé in 1930 to independently produce his films. And since his death in 1989, we've transformed into an archive dedicated to the preservation of his legacy. In our continuing efforts to preserve his films, we have shortlisted 10 titles that are in need of urgent restoration. Out of these, we've successfully restored six films. We have part funding for two more titles. The Hermit Crab, A Sarah or the Witch's Dance. We are seeking full funding for two more titles. Diatoms and Ias and Stenorhynchus. All these films will be scanned in 4K for a 2K restoration. All the restoration work will be carried out in two of Europe's biggest restoration laboratories. We will be making new screening prints for these films. We will also be making a special Blu-ray edition for all these 10 restored films. This will be the first time the films of Jean Panlevé will be presented in the Blu-ray format. Finally, all these restored films will be printed back to 35mm film for archival purposes. Panlevé's films are shown throughout the world all around the year in cinema spaces, in art galleries, in museums, in schools, in scientific research conferences. We need your help to save these four films. We hope that by preserving Pandavay's films, we will be able to preserve his sense of wonder towards the world that we live in.
I think the clip is now over. Yeah, Beautiful. Was, sorry. Yeah, also some kind of a call for action in the end. Uh, Very good website also for the archive of Pan Leve available for those interested. So uh, to wrap this uh, scientific and artistic evening up, um, as, as Mika mentioned, Pan Leve thought that there are like three kinds of scientific films and uh, you wrote, Mika, that in Pan Leve's view, we should learn from the sea urchins and not about sea urchins. So if, if all of you, if you contemplate on your own subjects, be them like um, these solar phenomena or uh, landscape in Lapland or solar astronomers or then frogs or, or found scientific image Mm, are these uh, scientific images merely in, in your own, own thinking, are they like merely instruments for learning about something else or is there some, some layer or essence we could learn from? Yeah, go ahead. Now you are, all of you are muted, actually. <laughs> okay. So, uh, yes, I think it's often mentioned that uh, all artists are basically doing a uh, portrait, whether it's abstract painting or narrative film or whatever. So uh, I think it's interesting. Maybe there's some connection thing. Commented that uh, what the visual artist or artist in all genres are doing all the time it's a self-portrait sort of so whether it's abstract or narrative film or piece or whatever so uh, I, I relate to the problem yeah. uh, and uh, and uh, also with the other, other works I've been uh, working with scientific footage it's uh, I think it uh, of course tells about uh, my uh, interests, but also uh, the dreams and hopes for the mankind to work with technology to try to discover, try to go beyond uh, our uh, knowledge and, and um, dream what could be possible. So in a way I think it's also a very good uh, and transparent way of uh, to look at the human condition, if you like. Yeah, just to, um, I mean, that, that self-portrait comment is interesting because I feel like for me, uh, despite having, you know, being very interested in scientific measurement overall, um, I mean, I think it may have been the research I've done into into how measurement is described in quantum physics that you know the observer affects the thing that is observed and the kind of like fine points of how that is um, I don't know of, of what you're able to measure I think I've come to realize that you know I can try to I, I've sort of I don't I don't know if I believe in documentation anymore <laughs> And that, you know, the only thing I can do is to show you what I see, how I see it. And so in that way, it actually is also a self-portrait, even though it's not, it's not visually about me. It's actually just ends up being about what I am showing you because that's what I see and that's how I present it. And, you know, it's funny because I, I think I started off, you know, being like, oh yeah, I can be a tool for measuring. Like I can show you something as it is. And then I realized like, no, I can't. I can only show you something as I see it. And so, you know, I like to, um, I hope that, that my work can be about all of those things. Um, but, you know, but then at the same time, I also do feel like um, I learn about these landscapes by looking at them through my camera. And I spend a lot more time looking at them, looking at the images of them than even, you know, of individual details of them than the real thing maybe. Um, and the camera leads me to look at these things. 
So in that sense, I think I can learn about them. I can learn something about them um, through this engagement. Um, but I think the work is presenting itself um, as almost an open question of saying, what can you learn about me, about the subject of the image and also about me as the artist, but it's sort of presenting that open question. It's an invitation to the views of mysticism to, to images in, you know, like if you, uh, you know, why do we humans use images? Why do we need them to understand? Or, you know, what, what do we need them for? Um, and uh, that I think that, you know, that, you know, you can try to look at how many different people's use, people use images and that way maybe understand it, you know, a little bit more, but we, ne we never really get to, you know, we, we never completely demystify, you know, the, the concept of image. And I think that's, you know, fascinating. But I wanted to just really quickly tell you also how, how I uh, started working with, uh, with Sarah, because um, this is the third, um, you know, artwork in a row that I made about um, a scientist, like a female scientist. Uh, the Mars film was actually having a lot of male scientists as well, and engineers and researchers, and it just had a lot of people. But the main person was a, is a, um, a female uh, roboticist, and um, and so and earlier I was making this piece about an ethno ethnograph. Uh, eth uh, what do you call it? Ethnography. <laughs> they had a we uh, when we sh we went um, shooting or we did uh, some location scouting back in 2015. Um, we wanted to shoot at this little observatory up on the mountain top uh, outside of um, JPL, like close to JPL um, in Pasadena, Los Angeles, and and then uh, we contacted and actually Sarah joined that um, that observatory in the 60s and she was the first female scientist uh, then to be accepted you know uh, it and it also was a long process i think uh, she told me in the interview um and i think both you know in a way art uh, or film and astronomy have both been these places where women have had uh, you know or still are having like kind of um, it's it's not it's a hostile place for for women to be in many times and and just the fact also that there just are no uh, very few women in in the history and and so you can grow up seeing only films made by men and hearing only about men ma male astronomers uh, so it's it's quite a huge revolution going on um, I think in 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 that sense um, but um, so so basically um, Sarah um, gave us access to this observatory and we filmed there and and uh, when we got to know Sarah, I was just mesmerized by, by basically her, um, the environment she has created for herself um, to allow her, um, her work and, and also the devotion that she, uh, she has, I mean, um, she's done a lot of things uh, and uh, but, but I am, um, her, her main interest and and so, so that was really amazing. And then we, when we went back in 2017, we, um, I did this interview with her and, and sh uh, filmed her in her, her garden with, with, the, with the telescope that she uses for her work. So I'm really glad, glad that this, all of, all this whole exhibition or, you know, that she, I was able to include this work in this exhibition and, and uh, to do the panel and everything. So thank you so much, Sarah. Yeah. Sarah, you are muted. No. I'm okay. unmuted. I'm unmuted now. Okay. Yes. No, so, not yeah. anymore. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Mina. It's been really marvelous working with you. And um, I think both both art and science are, are are helping to bring the world together in peaceful ways. And uh, because we realize how much we have in common and how valuable it is to have somebody else's view that you don't have in common with them. And uh, both uh, science and art, uh, uh, we are associating with people all over the world, um, all of the time. And you just can't imagine, you know, uh, the destructive things that are going on. Um, uh, we're able to counter that. We're able to counter that. And hopefully in the long run, the, you know, 
bring the art and the science and all the other aspects of life together that we appreciate will eventually give us world peace. I think these are the perfect words to end this panel. Um, as as like bio art societies is also one venue for bringing science and art together. And uh, I've been enjoying this very much. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Mika. Thank you, Mina. And thank you, Leah. And thank you, Erich and Mateo there in the background. Thank you. And, yeah. Do you want to say something, Eric? Yeah, I just want to thank the audience also who was uh, uh, sticking around with us. And um, uh, thank you to the panel also. And I, I hope uh, we are able to meet again in real life soon. <laughs>